On Saturday, March 25th of 2017, a man called 911 and said that he murdered someone. He said that he was sleepwalking and couldn't remember what happened. This is the twisted case of Randy Herman Jr. Hello, friend and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also professional soccer. Go! But today, we're going to go over the case of Randy Herman Jr. and what he did to his supposed best friend. You're going to learn about how terrible of a liar he is. For our story today, we're heading to West Palm Beach, Florida. With a population of around 118,000 people, it's a part of Palm Beach County. The area was originally known as Lake Worth Country and was settled in the 1870s to 1880s by a few hundred settlers. On November 5th of 1894, 78 people met at the Calaboose, which was the first jail and police station, and created the West Palm Beach as we know it today. If you ever happen to be here, well, that's awesome. There's a whole lot of things to do. You could go to the Norton Museum of Art, which was found founded in 1941 by Ralph Hubbard and his wife Elizabeth Calhoun Norton. There's many masterpieces of 19th and 20th century paintings and sculptures by European and American artists. Sounds awesome. You could visit the Palm Beach Zoo and Conservation Society and see around 550 different types of animals. This includes a panther. Or if you have some money to spend, you could visit the Tanger Outlets and go to Tommy Hilfiger. But that's not why we're in town today. Randy Allen Herman Jr. was born on December 28th of 1992 in Laceyville, Pennsylvania to his mother Kathy Adams and his father Randy Herman Sr. We're going to look into his dad in a little bit, but just know this. Like father, like son, they're both terrible. Laceyville is a small town on the Susquehanna River with a population of about 400 people. Randy has an older sister and both of them were raised only by Kathy. Their father wasn't really in their lives and he didn't exactly keep in touch. When he did call, he was usually drunk or explaining why he couldn't visit. Their mother Kathy was working as a bartender and a server and sometimes even working up to three jobs to support the children. They bounced around from apartment to apartment a total of seven times. Randy was a normal child child for the most part, but his mother said that he suffered from sleepwalking. Basically, he would wake up in the middle of the night and do things, but he had no idea he was doing it. When Randy got to high school, he was considered well-liked and a friendly guy. He had a lot of friends, and one of those friends' names was Jordan Preston. She was the same age as Randy and also had a younger sister named Brooke. We're going to look more into Brooke here shortly, but she would hang out with Jordan, Randy, and the rest of their crew, and they were all extremely close. They'd have dinner at the Preston family's house like every week. Randy and the sisters got so close to the point where they were basically his sisters. In 2011, he graduated high school and he became the first person in his family to attend college. For two years, he studied criminal justice at Mansfield University and worked part-time as a corrections officer at the county jail. He was just getting himself prepared for what was coming in the future. But Randy was a frequent user of recreational and drinking. And by frequent user, I mean he was addicted and it was a daily activity. In August of 2013, he was arrested for a good green possession and it ended up costing him his job at the jail. He went to court and he pled to a lesser charge, but then a few days later on Labor Day weekend, he was arrested for driving drunk. Randy ended up leaving school and moving back home. Here, he worked at his family's stone cutting business and he also worked at a beef processing plant. He did this for about eight months or so, and because his license got revoked, he ended up getting a state-issued ID card so he could go out to bars and drink alone. Halfway through his probation period in May of 2014, his sister got married. Randy ended up leaving the reception plastered, and he swore to his family that he was okay to drive. Later into the night, he ended up getting charged with his second DUI in under a year. He was set to serve a one month jail sentence and while he was in there, he saw his father's name and face. Randy hadn't seen his dad in years, but he was on a breaking news alert on a local station. The broadcasters reported that a woman had been murdered and Randy Herman Sr. was the prime suspect. His girlfriend, Gail Monahan, had failed to show up for work and she was then found in their house deceased. 
She had been shot in the head, and it was quickly discovered who did it. Her longtime boyfriend, Randy Herman Sr., then fled to Alabama, and it wasn't long before he committed the endgame in April of 2015. Randy Jr.'s good friend Jordan ended up moving to Florida, and she was constantly nagging him and her sister Brooke to move down with her. Jordan called Randy with updates about what was going on, and he started to think about living there himself. Almost a year later, and in July of 2016, that dream would become a reality when him and Brooke decided to actually make it happen. The two of them moved in with Jordan in a pink house on Sarah Zen Drive in West Palm Beach. Now we can look at Brooke a little bit more. Brooke Chantel Preston was born on September 1st of 1995 in Sayre, Pennsylvania to John Edward Preston and Nancy Slabicki. She graduated from Wyalusian Valley High School in 2013 and then went to the State College of Florida. Here she obtained an associate's degree in business management. Brooke was in a relationship with a guy named Brian Brown and he was the love of her life. She had many goals and dreams and was very determined to earn her bachelor's degree. She had always believed that nothing was too hard or too big to overcome. Brooke was driven, motivated, and inspired to succeed. Shortly after her and Randy arrived in Florida, Randy got a pretty good job working at a marketing firm. He had to wear a jacket and a tie, and he found a new sense of pride while he was working there. His family back home was ecstatic for him, and they were glad that he was finally maturing. But within only four months, he ended up quitting because he said he couldn't deal with the inconsistency of a commission-based salary. Hmm, all right, I guess that's kind of fair. Randy then decided to chill for a few months with no job because he felt like he needed to clear his head. When his father died, he left him $25,000, and this for sure helped Randy during this period of time kind of. He spent every night drinking and staying out late, only to sleep the entire next day. Monday through Sunday, he would go to local bars and spend nearly $200 a night on alcohol and blow. It took only three months before that inheritance money ran out, and Randy was broke. A few weeks later, in December of 2016, Brooke's boyfriend had gotten a job opportunity that took him from Pennsylvania to New York. They talked about things and decided it would be best if they lived together, and so she joined him. She moved from Florida to Buffalo, New York, and together they were very happy. But because Brooke moved so quickly, she left behind a ton of stuff and even her car. She decided to plan a weekend trip to Florida to go get everything. She chose the weekend of March 23rd of 2017, and her sister Jordan was going to be away in Colorado visiting her boyfriend. Brooke decided to still go through with it and planned to say goodbye to any of her friends in West Palm Beach. When she arrived, Randy was broke and had pretty much zero dollars to his name. It was very obvious that he was depressed and not doing good. He vowed to himself that he would rebound from this, and for two weeks leading up to Brooke's visit, he stopped drinking and doing But as soon as she got there, he immediately went back to who he really is. An awful person. On Brooke's second day in town, the two of them woke up early and went to get a 12-pack of Bud Light and a bottle of champagne. They went and hung out on the beach, and Randy took this photo of Brooke, and it appeared as if everything was going great. Randy finished the 12-pack of beer, and they decided to go back home at about 6 p.m. They then stopped by another liquor store so Randy could get two more cases of Bud Light. Brooke had absolutely no idea that this night was going to be her last. She had assumed that she was just going to see some old friends, get her belongings, and then leave. But that's the exact opposite of what transpired. They had gotten back to the house at around 6.30ish and kept drinking, but Brooke had told some friends that Randy was being annoying. He had become very hostile through the night and was slurring his words and stumbling through the house. A friend of theirs named Kyle McGregor was talking to Brooke during this, and he was coming over to hang out and drink. When he was about halfway there, a bit after 7pm, Brooke texted him and said, Just come get me. I'm ready to kill Randy. He's pissing me off. It's very ironic that she sent this text and said specifically what she said because of what's about to follow. Kyle told Brooke she could stay the night at his house and leave to go to New York in the morning. He would soon show up to Randy's, and when he got inside, the two of them didn't say much to each other. Kyle could clearly tell that Randy was belligerent and drunk out of his mind. He was grabbing drinks left and right, and a few minutes later, he just disappeared. Brooke went to her bedroom to pack a bag, and when she opened her closet, Randy was in there. He was bare naked, and when he saw Brooke, he raised a finger to his mouth and said, shh. 
Brooks stormed out of there and immediately told Kyle about it. The two of them went back to Kyle's house and had an actual normal night. In the morning, the plan was that Brooke was going to go get her stuff from the house and then have some breakfast with Kyle. Randy woke up in his bed and he was still a bit drunk. He had a really bad hangover and when he walked into the kitchen, Brooke was packing the last of her things into her car. She invited him to go with her and Kyle to get breakfast, but Randy declined and said that he was in no shape to leave the house. So he decided to just go back to bed. While drifting to sleep, he remembered that he was supposed to give her a t-shirt for her boyfriend. The shirt was a memorial for one of their friends who passed away after walking into the path of a car while drunk. So Randy sent Brooke a message and after her and Kyle were done breakfast, she went back to Randy's. Randy was still in bed, and so when Brooke got there, he pointed to the dresser where the shirt was. Brooke grabbed the shirt and then hugged him while he was in bed and said goodbye. The last thing Randy remembers is watching Brooke close the door behind her as she left, and then he laid back down and went to sleep. Less than 20 minutes later, Randy said that he came to and was holding his hunting knife. He was covered in scratches, cuts, and blood was everywhere. At the bottom of his feet laid Brooke and she was deceased beyond the point of recognition. Randy had stabbed her more than two dozen times all over. Neighbors later came out to Palm Beach County Sheriff's deputies and said they heard sounds of a woman's screams coming from the house, but none of them called 911. What? Why would you not? After Randy apparently came to, he then drove to a park and called 911 and said that someone's been murdered. He was then arrested and then interrogated for over an hour, so here's a few minutes of that. No, nobody will. Do you, do you want to be the one or do you want us to make a phone call? Like I said, this is Steve, I'm Jeremy. Um, Basically, we just want to try to figure out what happened and what's going on, okay? And we need your help for that. All right? Um, and it's just very important to be honest with us. It's very important to get the truth out, okay? Because the, the truth is basically which will help everybody. Okay, that's all we ever asked for. Because you know, sometimes things happen, things things get out of control or, or whatever, but we need your help to figure out what happened, okay? Listen, Randy, I can tell that you're remorseful. What well, we need to know, who, who's, who's Brooke? Huh? And, who, and who's Jordan? That's what we, we need to find out. Now, are they... Are they friends? Girlfriends? Wife? Randy, you talked about telling your mom, but I... What do you want us to tell your mom? Okay. <laughs> What's mom's number? <laughs> do you want to talk to mom? Who, who did you have the incident with? Is it Jordan Brooke? Brooke. Okay, it's Brooke. Okay. And Jordan, is Jordan, did she leave state? Is Brooke alive? Well, right now, they're back, they're back at the scene. Um, everything is everything is is still developing. So we're trying we're trying to find out exactly what transpired. Like I said, your mom's going to have questions, and I want to know what what we're going to have to answer to your mom. She's good. Obviously, she's going to have questions for us. 
you know, I'm sure that, you know, if you could change the situation, you know, you would. And believe me, we, we would we would if we could. Absolutely. And we know that. And listen, that's obvious. We know that that you're sorry for it. If you weren't, you wouldn't have dialed 911. We know that you're remorseful. Like I said, we need to get in touch with Brooks family no. we need to let them know that she's injured we need to call your mom because what you wanted I, I heard jordan went to colorado is that right she knows what do you mean she knows does she know know what no nobody knows what happened we don't even know what happened that's why we're sitting here trying to trying to get it from you Okay. Randy, we need you to help us, buddy. What's what is Brooke gonna tell me? Okay. What is she gonna tell me? What is she gonna tell me, Randy? Right? There's a reason things happen. Okay? Things happen for a reason, Randy. Okay, you didn't just wake up today and say that something bad is gonna happen or something good is gonna happen. Things happen for a reason, Randy. Okay? You have to know. You know what happened. You just don't want to get it out, but you need to. Okay, it's tearing you up in there, Randy. You need to get it out. Okay, what is Brooke going to tell me happened? Okay, is she going to say that you attacked her? Okay, what is she going to tell me? You need to do this now, all right? You need to do this for Brooke, all right? You need to do this for you. You need to let me know what, what started it. Something started it, Randy. You got given her a t-shirt, and the next thing you know, something happened. Okay? What happened, Randy? Did you want her to leave? Randy, did you want her to leave? Did you want her to leave? It's a yes or no question. Did you want her to leave? You don't care. Okay? Did you guys argue? I don't think so. You don't think so? Then how did she get hurt? It was fine. Everything is fine. You don't end up calling 911 and saying that there's been a murder. Okay? So it's not fine, Randy. Everything's not fine. We don't go from a, a, a T-shirt and a hug to a phone call to 911. Something happened in between there, Randy. And you know what happened. How did you get scratched? You have a scratch on your chest. How did you get scratched? You give her the t-shirt, she gives you a hug. How did she end up hurt? So, I can't do this right now. All right. It wasn't long before court dates and the whole nine yards would come, and Randy's attorneys attempted to plead insanity. His assistant public defender, Joseph Walsh, had told the court that Randy had no motive and no history of violence. And the only rational explanation was that he was sleepwalking during the incident. His mother, Kathy Adams, testified and said that Randy had sleepwalked numerous times as a child. But Jordan Preston, Brooke's sister and Randy's roommate, said in the six months they were living together, she's never seen Randy sleepwalk. Also, a forensic psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Wade C. Myers testified that it's impossible to sleep through the action of stabbing and argued that the motive was in nature. He said the day before Brooke was murdered, Randy was super drunk and hid nude in her closet. In May of 2019, Randy was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. He really doesn't believe he's a bad person and blames everything on sleepwalking. He thinks he deserves a second chance and has even wrote the New York Times and said, I believe what happened in my case could have been the culmination of tremendous stress, depression, trauma, and alcohol that essentially resulted in some unexplainable mental breakdown. I'm beyond sorry. Part of me feels like I deserve a life sentence, but the other part of me knows I did not intentionally do this and I deserve a second chance in life. No, you deserve life in prison. Actually, 
Probably much worse, Brooke Chantel Preston was a spitfire who brought joy into everyone's life that she touched. She lived in the moment and grabbed every opportunity that came her way, and she made the most of it. She had just started a new journey in New York with her boyfriend and was really making her dreams come true. It's sad that she'll never get to see those days and that someone so close to her and someone who was supposedly like a brother to her could do that. I hope that she's resting peacefully and that her family is one day able to find some peace. A documentary about what happened to Brooke was made on Hulu, and it goes into the mind of Randy, and it's pretty distasteful, to be honest with you. Brooke's sister, Jordan, has tried to get it taken down, and has even started a petition, but it hasn't worked. I can only imagine what they all go through, and I really wish them the absolute best. As for Randy Herman Jr., what an awful person, to say the least. He really thinks he deserves a second chance after what he did? No. The only thing that he deserves is the fiery flaming pits of hell. Nothing else. Randy somehow managed to get married while in jail to a woman named Nicole. She posts TikToks left and right about how she's a prison wife and all about Randy. He brutally murdered someone. What is wrong with you? Some people, they really need help. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horror Flying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.